Liz Newell with Hometown TV. We're at the second annual gala of Drew's Center for Religion, Culture, and Conflict. Why don't we take a look and talk to Dr. Baer about his involvement in the program. Tell us a little bit about your interaction with this program. Yeah, thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here and talk to you. Is this event and this uh, location for it started with my son, Josh, who majored at Rutgers in, among other things, Middle Eastern Studies, Jewish Studies, and was very much enamored of cultural and religious issues and decided to go to Drew University to study this at more length. And he met Jonathan Goldman there. And based on that, he got very, very involved. And as he explained it to me, I became very interested in it as well. So that's why we are here today, and that's why we feel that this is a very important event for a very important cause. I'm with David Lair from the Arava Institute. So congratulations on being one of the honorees today. Thank you very much. So tell me a little bit about your institute. The Arava Institute for Environmental Studies was founded in 1996 in order to build bridges between peoples in the Middle East. We bring Jews and Arabs together, Israelis, Palestinians, Jordanians, and international students in order to teach that nature knows no borders. So I'm with Chris Rodriguez, the Director of Homeland Security and Preparedness of New Jersey. Welcome, Chris. Thanks, Liz. Thank you. So I hear you're the keynote speaker. Yes, I am. Very excited about it. And a resident of Morris County. That's very true. I uh, was born in Denville and grew up in Persephone and Booton. So. so tell me how you got involved in the Drew University. Sure. Um, well, I met uh, Jonathan Golden, who's the uh, director of the center, uh, a few months back. And I was giving a, a lecture at, um, at the Peace Islands Institute, talking a lot about some of my previous experience in the intelligence community, talking about peace and conflict. And uh, we had a conversation afterwards, and he invited me to become more active in the center. So I'm uh, very excited to be doing so. Maggie Doyne from Blink Now, and she's one of the recipients of the Peacemaker Awards. Welcome, and congratulations. Thank you. It's so good to be here. So tell me a little bit about Blink Now and how you got started. The Blink Now Foundation is all about changing the world in the blink of an eye. Um, when I was 18, I took a gap year and was traveling around the world and ended up in the foothills of the Himalayas of Nepal. And I was astounded by the number of children and orphans. And long story short, I decided to start an orphanage or children's home as I like to call it and today I'm the mom to 51 kids. So good evening I'm Jonathan Golden and on behalf of Drew University and the Center on Religion, Culture and Conflict we welcome to us, you to our second annual gala. Um, this is a big night and we begin with a big thank you to our hosts who have once again opened their big hearts and their big house to the CRCC so we thank Dr. Saul and Mary Bear. We also thank our Peace Builder Platinum Gala sponsors, Betsy Bernard and Lori Peter. Our gold sponsor, Eileen Manning Quick, who is right there. there you are. And, uh, and our silver sponsors, Emilio and Regina Agia, as well as Phil and Donna Sabilio. Let's give a big hand. I don't know where people are sitting, there they are. And uh, now this is a big tent uh, in both a literal and a figurative sense. It's big because there are so many of us, right? Representatives of Drew and the CRCC, our like-minded friends from around the world, and our many wonderful supporters, all of you here tonight. And I'll just, um, just a moment ago, actually, on the side, Maggie said to me, you know, um, there, it is us, right? There's an us, and we're all sort of just trying to chip away at this from different angle. So just a lot of really wonderful, like-minded people in the room tonight. And it is also a big tent um, in a broader sense, a gathering of people of varying heritage, nationalities, faith traditions to make manifest and realize the CRCC mission. That mission of the center is to build peace and interfaith understanding locally and globally through education and empowerment of future leaders. Since we gathered here in March of last year, uh, CRCC has formed exciting new partnerships and embarked on innovative initiatives in the classroom. Working with the Interfaith Youth Corps, with a grant from the Teagle Foundation, Drew CRCC has become an important actor in a national effort to advance interfaith engagement on campuses. 
We are pioneering a program in global peace and interfaith leadership for a cohort of first year students. Some of them are here tonight. They're sitting at your tables, my wonderful students. Um, and just a few weeks ago, Drew welcomed Ibu Patel, founder and CEO of the Interfaith Youth Corps, to our campus for meetings with students and with faculty and with community leaders, and of course, to speak at the Shirley Sugarman Interfaith Forum. And we thank Shirley as well, who Shirley is. I'm sorry, I don't know where anybody is. There she is. Engaging faculty and students from all three schools in provocative conversations hour on the table lunch talk series has provided plenty of food for thought. Uh, topics ranging from the neuroscience of how the brain forms and reverses stereotypes to questions about our identity that our many transnational students grapple with every day. We responded to current events with a panel and workshop on the tensions between religious freedom and freedom of expression, uh, topics that are hot in the news right now. And I can report that in cooperation with the CRCC, um, as well as friends like um, Director Rodriguez, who is here with us this evening, there he is, um, the Casperson School of Graduate Studies is launching a certificate program in conflict resolution and leadership this fall. And we're all very excited about that as well. We have given voice to important peace activists from around the world, and we have joined on the ground efforts such as the Trans Boundary Water Project with the Arava Institute, which you'll hear a little bit more later about tonight when David Lehrer speaks. Um, we continue in our role as a hub for interfaith interaction in New Jersey, hosting a meeting of the Interfaith Council, again of the Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness, and a recent convening of delegates from northern New Jersey's major interfaith organizations. I call it a meeting of the heads of the five families, right? All <laughs> came together. In January, CRCC led a peace tour in Ireland and presented journalist Niall O'Dowd with the Peace Builder Award for his role in the Good Friday peace process. Building on the success of the Summer Institute on Religion and Conflict Transformation, alumni of the Institute reunited in Ireland as well as in Jerusalem um, as part of our ongoing work. Initially funded by the Carnegie Corporation of New York, we are really, really excited. This just in, we are announcing live tonight um, that the Endeavor Foundation also just agreed to fund this program going forward into the future. So that is very exciting news as well. Yep. So, as we build on these great milestones and embrace the opportunities that lay ahead, we are excited to have all of you on board with us. And so now, it is my great privilege to introduce to you the president of Drew University, Mary Ann Benninger. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, this is going to be always a very special event for me because it was the very first event that I attended as president-elect of Drew last year. So it's great to um, be here having experienced the full cycle of a year. Thank you all for coming out tonight to support the great work of Drew Center on Religion, Culture, and Conflict. And thank you especially, Mary and Sal, for hosting us here in this lovely, lovely setting. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm also pleased that Jonathan has recently stepped into the position as acting director of the center, and as of January 1st, he'll be named director of the center. The board just approved that the other day. Did I, did I accidentally say January 1st? Yeah, July 1st. <laughs> I just wanted to see the look on your face. <laughs> Through its co-curricular programming, the CRCC has become a model for interdisciplinarity and cooperation between Drew's College of Liberal Arts, the Casperson School of Graduate Studies, and the Drew Theological School. We have historically been a university with an international vision, and today our student body is increasingly global and engaged. The opportunities that Drew offers outside the classroom demonstrate this ethos. Recently, we've been exploring in depth the concept of the university and the city through our relationships with New York, with London, with Seoul, our ties to Newark, Morristown, and Madison. 
At the heart of this exploration is how Drew students, faculty, and staff, and alumni engage with the world beyond the forest, and that's what we call our campus, from internships to local nonprofits to cross-cultural programs overseas. These connections invariably make a difference, not only for students at the university, but for the world at large, providing the very essence of a world-class liberal arts education. At Drew, we create game-changing global citizens by preparing our students, as our mission says, to flourish both personally and professionally as they add to the world's good by responding to the urgent challenges of our time with rigorous, independent, and imaginative thought. Well, the program tonight highlights how two organizations and the people who lead them respond to the urgent challenges of our time. They combat poverty, conflict, and inequality within education, with, with ed, they combat it with education and with empowerment. As a formative experience, education has the power to create the future peace builders of our world, and that's certainly what we aim to do at Drew. Now it is my honor to introduce tonight's keynote speaker, Chris Rodriguez. Chris was appointed by Governor Christie in July, last July, to lead New Jersey's Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness. Chris is an intelligence specialist who has monitored terrorist groups in the Middle East and South Asia and who served in Iraq. Chris was born and raised right here in Morris County and holds a bachelor's degree, another from another great liberal arts college, <laughs> Williams College, and a master's degree and PhD from the University of Notre Dame. Please join me in welcoming Chris Rodriguez. Thank you, Marianne, and um, thank you, Jonathan, uh, for inviting me here tonight. Um, I also want to thank, of course, our, our host, Dr. and Mrs. Baer. Thank you for showing me your beautiful home as well. Um, that, was, that was excellent. Uh, so welcome to the second annual gala of the CRCC. Um, let me begin by commending um, Maggie, founder and CEO of Blink Now Foundation, of course David who's uh, representing uh, the Arava Institute, uh, for your accomplishments and what you do every day uh, to aid our planet, our world, and to make, uh, to make our lives more peaceful and more secure. So thank you very much. You know, I want to start uh, with a story. As everyone knows, yesterday was Mother's Day, and uh, let's also give it up for all the mothers in the room. Yeah. And, um, and so one of the things I did yesterday morning was uh, I went out with my five-year-old. She usually gets up around the 5, 5.30 range. So um, I went out with her to go get some muffins and breakfast for, uh, for my wife, and who's pregnant and is expecting our third next month who happened to be also uh, sleeping with our three-year-old, who also off, always comes in the, the bed every night. And so we're driving along, and um, my, my daughter, who's sitting in the back, uh, looks out the window, and she's peering out the window. I can tell she's thinking about something. And as five-year-olds often do, they ask like the most poignant questions. And she looked at me. I said, Juliana, what's, uh, what are you thinking about? And she said, Dad, um, why are there weapons? You think about that. And, you know, first of all, like, don't judge my parenting, okay, because I hadn't had my coffee. <laughs> had, like, it was early in the morning. And, um, and the way I answered the question was, um, in many ways, reflect, a reflection of um, my own professional career. And in many ways, it's ironic that I'm standing here at a, at, a, at a CRCC event when much of my professional career has been based on war and conflict. Um, particularly in the dark days after 9-11. Um, and I told her that weapons are meant to protect good guys against bad guys. I don't know if that was the best answer, but I'm going to circle back to that at the end because I think I have a better answer for her um, when I see her uh, tomorrow. Um, as I said, my professional career has been defined by the events of 9-11. Uh, I joined um, what many of you know as the Culinary Institute of America. Um, yeah, you got it. See? Yeah. Um, after 9-11 in 2003, uh, and for most of the, la of the last decade, I spent my time in the Middle East and South Asia monitoring and countering many of the terrorist threats, um, threatening your security, our security, and the security of our allies around the world. 
And in my position now as Director of the Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness, I am charged um, by the governor to uh, coordinate and defend the state against terrorist threats and increasingly also against uh, cyber threats, which are, which are becoming a major problem for not only the state but also uh, for the country and for the world. Uh, but I also have another mission. And it's part of what Jonathan talked about in his remarks, and that is engaging with the interfaith community. What I have seen in my federal career and certainly my state career is the importance of building those relationships with the local communities. Because only through talking and dialogue can we actually be more secure. Um, we live in a, in a world now where the threat of lone wolf terrorism is pervasive. And often, the public is our first line of defense. If they see something, they can report it and say something about it. And we need those relationships. We need to get out into the communities, and we need to talk to people. We need to talk to interfaith communities of all, of, of all stripes. And I will say that when we talk to our interfaith communities, one of the things that I often talk about is the fact that my now boss, then US Attorney Chris Christie, right after 9-11, started the first, first interfaith um, committee, recognizing that after 9-11 we needed a link with the Muslim community to talk about what had happened and to ensure that if anything like that threatened to happen again, they had a direct line to, to federal and local law enforcement. That program still exists to this day and I will say it's as strong as ever. And there, Actually there are some representatives here who sit on that interfaith, uh, interfaith committee. I also want to say that these relationships only underscore and heighten the work of the people that we are here to celebrate. You know, through Maggie's community work building in Nepal, and, and we all pray for the citizens of that country in the aftermath of the terrible earthquake that happened there um, not too long ago. But Maggie has established an impressive model for American philanthropy, um, one that empowers and, employ and employs locals, right, so that they can take on the challenges of poverty and marginalization that often takes place in countries or in places like Nepal. Environmental crises, okay, we're here to also um, celebrate the Arava Institute. These environmental crises and pressure often causes conflict in places that don't have the institutions or don't have the capacities to provide their citizens with what it is they need to survive and to thrive. I will say that any institute that can get Israelis, Palestinians, and Jordanians talking and talking about common problems is a great one, and we need more of that in our world. I'd also like to recognize the CRCC. You work to transcend, transcend cultural and religious borders to build peace. And through the CRCC's work with global partners, its educational initiatives, with students, and its engagement with the public, you also tackle some of the most pertinent issues of our time. I'm also thrilled to be part of, Jonathan, what you were saying, to be involved in a new certificate in conflict resolution at Drew. Um, and I will, you know, I do welcome the opportunity to train the next generation and educate the next generation of leaders in that respect. So here's how I would answer my daughter and what I will tell her, um, kind of a, you know, circle back with her on this one. She probably won't even remember she asked me the question. <laughs> but in reading about what Maggie did and what the Arava Institute, uh, Maggie does and the Arava Institute does, I will say that weapons aren't always bad things. Speaking out, advocating for the issues that you are passionate about, that can be a weapon against indifference and against people who turn a blind eye to the problems of the world. Talking, dialogue, negotiation, that can be a weapon against misperception and against potential conflict between countries, between neighbors, between people. And love can be a weapon against hatred, which is also unfortunately pervasive in our world today. So I want to thank you. I want to thank you for hosting me today and for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. Um, I also I want to leave enough time to hear from uh, more important people than I. So thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Javier Vieira, and I am the dean of the theological school at Drew. And when we're in such a beautiful setting as this, and the recipients of such extravagant generosity, it seems right that we just pause for a moment and give thanks. So will you do that with me? Oh.
O source of all that is holy and good, we are grateful. We give thanks for this beautiful home and the family who dwells here, for their hospitality and welcome, we are grateful. For the people with whom we share the blessing of this night, we are grateful. For the food and drink that strengthen our bodies and nourish our souls, we are grateful. For the work and mission of the CRCC and the possibilities of the more hopeful future its work will engender, we are grateful. For the gift of love, of friendship, and of common purpose. For the sounds and the beauty of nature. For all that is lovely and good in this world and in our lives, we are grateful. O source of all that is holy and good, we are grateful for this night. We are very grateful. Amen. This is the part that we all came for, the very, very, very exciting presentation of the CRCC Builder Awards. Um, as many of you know, last year we presented one to uh, AGFAF, the Afghan Girls Financial Assistance Fund, and uh, Leo Modiak, the founder of that organization, is here with us. Where's Leo? We also presented an award to Don Mullen for his work in the, um, in, in the Irish peace process. And he actually was just here over the weekend, but unfortunately he had to get back to Europe. There was peace building that needed to be done, so he's <laughs> back there now. Um, but Don, it's very exciting. Don will be with us teaching for a full semester at Drew University, again also for this conflict resolution program as well as our vaunted Irish studies program. Um, beginning next spring. So we're excited to have Dom back at Drew. And also, we, as we mentioned earlier, we presented the Peace Builder Award in January to Niall O'Dowd, the founder of, of Irish Central and Irish Times, for his um, direct involvement. He was really the person credited with getting Bill Clinton involved in the Irish peace process. So this is now already in its first year a very prestigious award. So we're very excited to present two very, very deserving awards this evening as well. And I'm very excited to present to you the first presenter of the awards. This is a former student of mine, Christina Ocampo, who just graduated Drew a couple of years ago. And she actually, when, um, when Chris Taylor and I announced that we were going to take some students to the Arava Institute several years ago for a program in environmental studies and peace building, Christina was the very first student to, uh, to jump on board and sign on. So Christina, please um, join us at the podium to present the award to the Arava Institute. Good evening. It is my honor to present the Drew CRCC Peace Builder Award to David Lehrer and the Arava Institute. As Jonathan just mentioned, I had the opportunity of a lifetime to study at the Arava Institute the summer between my sophomore and my junior year. The international seminar with professors Jonathan Golden and Chris Taylor brought together my passion for the environment and social justice issues in an unimaginable and yet tangible way. The international seminar consisted of an academic pre-departure course and an in-country experience where we spent three weeks meeting leaders and activists from nonprofits across Israel who use different platforms to build peace in the region. Our trip culminated at the Arava Institute in southern Israel, where we lived in the arid environment of the Negev Desert, alongside students from all around the world, including Israelis, Jordanians, and Palestinians, who are all living and learning together in an atmosphere of dialogue, cooperation, and peace. This experience taught me the significance and the power of grassroots peace building to address environmental issues that transcend cultural, historical, economic, political, religious, social, and ethnic boundaries. It shaped my personal growth and my professional development and instilled in me lessons that I carry with me till this day. My time at Arava not only reaffirmed my commitment to pursuing a career in environmental justice, particularly with a grassroots approach, but it also taught me to have hope and optimism that collecti collectively we can make this world a better place. I am so grateful to Drew University and the CRCC for providing me and my fellow classmates with the opportunity to learn the power of peace building, both inside the classroom and out in the world. An opportunity that I can honestly say I would have never experienced without the meticulous planning efforts by my professors, 
and the financial assistance of Drew and outside donors. And so it is with much gratitude to Drew University and all those involved that I present the Peace Builder Award to the Arava Institute. Thank you all. <coughs> Wait, you okay? Thank you all for having me here tonight. Thank you, uh, Jonathan. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Drew University. Thank you, the Bears, for having such a wonderful, wonderful place uh, to have such a wonderful event. The Aravai Institute for Environmental Studies was founded in 1996 to build bridges between people in the Middle East based on a common concern for the environment. We bring Jews and Arabs together, Israelis, Palestinians, Jordanians, and international students in order to teach that nature knows no borders. We are very proud of our long-term relationship with Drew University and the Center on Religion, Culture, and Conflict. Several years ago, Chris and Jonathan brought a group of students to our institute, as you just heard, to witness firsthand how the environment can be a platform for peace building and just last summer, Jonathan led our first transboundary uh, tour for an American faculty. The Aravai Institute Center for Transboundary Water Management has embarked on a new collaborative effort to engage Israelis, Palestinians, and Jordanians, Jordanians in meeting the challenges of water scarcity and wastewater treatment in the region. The effort is supported by an interfaith group here in the US called Build Israel Palestine, made, of Jews and, made up of Jews and Muslims who want to build water treatment facilities in the Middle East while building trust between people of faith in the US. When we started the Aravai Institute in 1996, we thought we would bring a bunch of Jews and Arabs together, throw them into a room, and teach them about the environment, because maybe that's something they can all agree on. And the students would talk about the rest of that stuff uh, on their own in the rooms or in the camp on the campus lawn. We quickly discovered that the students could live together for a semester or a year and just keep smiling at each other, not saying what they really think. We realized very quickly that we needed to initiate the conversation. So we created the Peace Building and Environmental Leadership Seminar, PELS for short, a once a week, not for credit required program for all students, where we talk about what they don't want to talk about, war, religion, occupation, terrorism, etc. Now this is the Middle East we are talking about, uh, so these sessions are not very quiet. But when the students ask why they have to go to the Pell sessions, we tell them that you can't learn how to live in peace with nature until you have learned how to live in peace with your neighbor. In the end, students will tell us that the peace building and environmental leadership seminar is the most important thing they did while at the Institute. We have over 850 alumni throughout the world. 650 of them are active in our Arava Peace and Environmental Network, the only membership organization in the Middle East in which the members are Israelis, Palestinians, and Jordanians. Last weekend, I participated in our 10th annual alumni conference with over 120 alumni in attendance, some of whom had been in the first semesters of the program, and many of whom now bring their spouses and children to the conference. The Arava Institute's vision is to inspire the next generation of peace builders and environmental leaders in the region. As we continue to grow our American constituency, we would love to see more American students at the Institute, particularly students from Drew University. And we look forward to continued cooperation with our friends in the CRCC. Thank you very much. You actually get an award. Wow. You get a carry it all the way to carry Israel. I'm going to carry this around. <laughs> we'll go. Where do you want to? Right Okay, and now, um, just before the presentation of our next award, I want to thank one other person 
who was absolutely instrumental in pulling this entire event together, and that is Kara, who is here with us, Kara Bradshaw. <laughs> Without whom this whole night would not have come together, probably as all of you know, uh, from your many interactions with her. But it was also Kara who actually brought um, uh, Maggie Doyne and Blink Now to our attention as well. She had gone to hear Maggie speak not long ago and said, you know, I think I have another candidate for the CRCC Peace Builder Award this year. And um, we were aware that the Dalai Lama had presented her with an Unsung Hero Award. And uh, actually, after we uh, named her the CRCC Peace Builder, you know, CNN is always following our lead. And they, they went and named her CNN Hero. So, um, but we are just so thrilled. I went and had the opportunity with local Rotary to hear Maggie speak just about a week or, or so ago, and she is absolutely wonderful. So we're so thrilled, and she is, of course, so deserving. Um, and we want to actually ask Matt um, Goldman to come and present the award to Maggie. So, uh Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Goldman, and I'm one of the uh, three co-founders of Blue Man Group and one of the six co-founders of the Blue School. And I met Maggie uh, six years ago uh, in my capacity at Blue School. And at Blue School, we have a mission to uh, cultivate young inquirers to build a harmonious and sustainable world. Uh, and so uh, there's a nice sort of fit with tonight's theme, I think. And uh, it was a very interesting first meeting because we had mutual friends uh, that I didn't know very well. And they were coming to tour the school and they said, hey, could, could, could we bring a, a special guest? She started uh, a home for children with no uh, parents. In, in Nepal and she wants to open a school and she doesn't know it yet but she's about to win the grand prize of the do something award and they've already budgeted it out and it's eighty thousand dollars to build the bamboo school and she's gonna about to win a hundred thousand dollars so she's gonna be able to build a school overnight and I was terrified <laughs> because I'm not good at keeping secrets <laughs> And the whole time that we were touring Maggie, I was petrified that I was going to spill the beans of the award she was going to, unbeknownst to her, win that night. Uh, well, to spend five minutes with Maggie is to know that you've just met a special, special person like no one you'll ever meet. And there's a kind of intense listening and eye contact that Maggie has that is so much more than listening and eye contact. It's a crossing of the souls. It's a, Maggie is really, truly getting who you are and what you're about. And it didn't take but five minutes for my wife, who's the chair of our board, and myself to know that we were going to be friends with Maggie Doyne for the rest of our lives. So it took about 10 minutes before we could ask how we could help. And uh, Maggie said, oh my god, it's amazing. We just got a new young boy in our school. His name is Sundar. And we said, that's it, Sundar. We'll sponsor Sundar. And uh, uh, that was the beginning of a long, exciting relationship. Well, six years so far, but I know it's going to add a zero at least. Uh, and then Maggie did open the school. And, you know, we were supposed to be giving Maggie some advice on opening a school. We had opened about five years prior. Um, but we opened with 15 children. And Maggie opened with 230 children. And we're 10 years in, 
and we're nowhere near sustainable. And Maggie School was sustainable on day one. So I realized even before that, but who's really advising who and who's <laughs> teaching who? So we get to the school and you're going to see a little clip, but not in that clip is the fact that Maggie School is the first and at the time only, maybe there are others now, but at the time, the only school that had in its charter no corporal punishment. And this was a complete new, innovative, difficult to swallow for the culture approach to education. And we had just gotten there and Maggie's school had hosted a all Sucret invited event of theater and dance and uh, all sorts of uh, 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 dramatic presentation and her, the entire school, her 230 kids, sat in the first rows and were perfectly beautifully behaved. And the town started spreading that Maggie Doyne was a liar because it was impossible that without corporal punishment those 230 kids could have sat there with such discipline and, and so well behaved. Remember that? So it actually took time for Maggie to overcome the reputation of lying in her town <laughs> about using no corporal punishment. So I'm already taking too long, but it's actually impossible for me to introduce Maggie without expressing some of these thoughts because people ask, who are my mentors? Who are my heroes? And Maggie Doyne is absolutely number one on my list of heroes. Um, she's an educator, a leader, a mother to 48 children or more. She's a head of school, a CEO, a healthcare provider, a peacekeeper, and if I ever were to have a sister, I would want her to be Maggie Doyne. Not like Maggie Doyne, I would want her to be Maggie Doyne. And if I were ever to have a daughter, I would like her to be Maggie Doyne, if you're willing to share her with me, Nancy. Uh, and my wife feels the same way. And, uh, but luckily, I do get to have a friend and collaborator. Ladies and gentlemen, this year's Peace Keeper Maker Changer <laughs> recipient, Maggie Doyne. Matt, thank you for that beautiful introduction. I want to be your daughter and your sister. <laughs> um, I'm Maggie Doyne, and I just want to thank everybody so much for, for being here tonight. I'm looking around, and I'm so fortunate to know a lot of the people in this room, and I, I see peace builders in each and every one of you. And I think that's the most beautiful thing about this tent. Um, it will take all of us. I am so honored to receive the Peace Builder Award from Drew CRCC, especially in my hometown, Mendham. Yay. <laughs> you know, people always ask me, I, I just got back from Nepal, I'm traveling with my youngest baby, um, and people always ask me, how do you go back and forth from remote Nepal, the foothills of the Himalayas, to Mendham, New Jersey? And yeah, it's like a totally different planet here. I don't think I could have chosen two opposite, more opposite parallel universes. But my answer is always, it's just gratitude. I mean, what a place to come back to every single time. What a hometown. 
Um, this is the community that made me, and I'm, I'm just so lucky and humbled to be a part of it. Um, it's been a really challenging time to be away from Nepal. While our school is not affected by the earthquake, um, we're about 300 kilometers west of the epicenter. Um, and our organization has been working on thoughtful responses that engage our local community and the world in relief efforts. With that in mind, I'd like to tell you about my journey from Mendham to Nepal. Um, so, <laughs> 10 years ago, I was a senior at Mendham High School, and I stood at a fork in the road. I woke up one morning, um, I was that kid that pretty much had college stamped on her forehead. Everybody was like, yeah, that's Maggie Doyne, she's going to college. Um, I played sports, I was the editor-in-chief of my yearbook, I was in that IB program and working hard to do well in the SATs. Um, but there was something really bubbling deep inside of me, and it was this feeling in my gut of, I know so much of what I'm supposed to do, but who am I really? Who am I inside, and, and what's my purpose here? And I thought that maybe I could find that by traveling outside of Mendham, away from New Jersey, and seeing a little bit of the world. I was very, very lucky to have the experience of a gap year. I ended up in the northeastern foothills of the Himalayas um, in India. And I started to meet many, many refugees coming across the border of India um, from Nepal. I didn't know it at the time, but there was a 13-year civil war that had ensued, creating about one million orphan kids. As Nepal emerged from a decade-long civil war, I saw and felt the lack of educational infrastructure and just that sheer number of orphan and displaced children. It was staggering to me. Um, I took my first trip to Nepal on a rickety bus. I was traveling with a friend um, to her remote Himalayan village. And I was meeting child after child after child. Uh, and you're shocked, right? You've never seen this kind of poverty. It's staring you in the face, these kids, these girls who look like you. Um, yet their reality was so different. Um, and the life-changing moment for me, um, it actually started with a little girl. Uh, her name was Hima. And in this one particular foothill marketplace that I was walking through, I saw a dry riverbed. And alongside the dry riverbed, there were hundreds of children breaking stones. And they were breaking stones all day, every day, picking up rocks and breaking them into little pieces and selling them for about a dollar a day. Um, and I saw that, and at first I just felt sad. I felt overwhelmed. I thought, what have we done as a human family? Um, but then this little girl named Hima, she was seven, uh, maybe six, and she was wearing an orange dress, and she smiled at me. And she said, Namaste, Didi. And Namaste means hello, and Didi means big sister. So that got me. Um, Mother Teresa, who I love, I love her, she used to say, peace starts with a smile. And I love that quote. <laughs> you think sometimes that peace involves weapons or, um, you know, armistices between nations and the UN. But if you think about it, that peace could really start with a smile. Um, we all have the ability to smile. And out of all the devastation that I saw and the sadness and kids breaking rocks and porters carrying thousands of pounds on their back, just children, it was Hema's smile that stopped me. And I thought to myself, I can't do anything about these thousands or these million children, but I could do something for this one little girl. And um, today, I think it's been 10 years, I'm 28, <laughs> uh, and there's not a single child on that dry riverbed breaking rocks because they all go to Coppola Valley School. <laughs> um, and, and I'm the mom to 51 kids, the mother of the legal guardian. I know I look so good, right? <laughs> How does that work? <laughs> um, and that's, 
that's what I believe and that's what I stand for. I believe that we can create the reality that we want to live in. I think that we can create a world where there is enduring peace and love and where everyone has their most basic human rights met and that our children and our great grandchildren will look back at our generation and we'll be rocking in our rocking chairs and our grandchildren will look at us and they'll say, Grandma, was there really poverty? Were children really working and dying before the age of five? And I have this vision of looking at my grandchildren and saying, yes, but that's in the history books and look at what we all did. Um, so I use my savings um, to, to create Coppola Valley Children's Home and School. I started as a babysitter. <laughs> Actually, there's a lot of families in the room who I babysat for. I had a little babysitting enterprise. <laughs> and um, I found out that this little piece of property was exactly $5,000. And I had $5,000 saved up in my bank, in bank account from the time I was about five years old. And uh, my mom's a realtor, by the way. <laughs> That, this is my first real estate investment, and uh, that property is now valued at about $300,000. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, and now it's the home to a school, it's my children's home, and a women's center, and a health, a health clinic, um, and my 51 beautiful children. So the most important thing to me always was that my children looked up, and they didn't just see me as a mom, you know, I'm foreign, I look a little bit different, but I wanted them to see a Nepali community. I wanted them to see Nepali people, Nepali faces. And today we are a team of 75, and I, I wanna acknowledge my entire team and in Nepal and here um, that make our project possible. Um, Coppola Valley School is now the number one performing school in the entire region of Nepal, um, if testing them. <laughs> Um, our students learn in a p positive and constructive environment from Nepali teachers and administrators. We're the first school, as Matt said, to outlaw corporal punishment, and since then we've had 25 other schools in the region take on the same pledge. <laughs> we now educate over 350 students from nursery, the little ones, all the way through 10th grade. And because the Nepali economy is not capable of creating good employment opportunities for young, young people, many Nepalis are going to work abroad. So we've been actively working to address this by creating employment opportunities within the community and within the region. Actually, this summer, it's summer right now in Nepal. I looked at my teenagers. I have, I think, 19 of them. And I told them, well, I was babysitting when I was growing up. And I started when I was 13. How about you all get summer jobs? Let's see what you can find. So they made their little resumes and they went around the village and the community applying for jobs. All 19 of them got a summer job and their first job. Um, a little bit more about what we do. Uh, we train 70 women in a training program. Uh, 20 of them have started their own businesses and every single year we circulate 20 women through our empowerment course and move them outwards into the community. We believe that women have the change and they're the caregivers of their children. So if we can find a way to empower them, our children's home lives will improve. Um, actually in 2010, You'll never believe this, but um, suicide emerged as the number one killer of women and children in Nepal and in the developing world. It surpassed child labor for the first time in, in our world's history. And so we addressed that by creating a mental health um, initiative and having open counseling centers where women and girls can come and report issues of domestic violence or abuse or trafficking and have a safe place a lot of times it's intimidating to go to the police, but with our roots in the community, they feel really safe to come to us. Um, we, uh, as, as the recent earthquake demonstrates, um, a natural disaster in a place like Nepal with the government and infrastructure still in its in infancy, it's tremendously devastating to the society. Last summer, a flood hit our community and displaced about 30,000 families from their homes. 
We offered shelter to pregnant women. We had 21 babies under our care at the Coppola house. Um, and that was also the summer that I became a mother to baby Ravi, uh, my youngest. He came in when he was just two months old, um, after his mother was killed. And he, at two and a half months, weighed about um, two and a half, oh, three, three and a half pounds. And that was, I was at 50 kids at this point. Um, and I thought, 50, that's a really good number. My youngest just turned five. He was a really hard baby. We're, we're clear, 50, that's something to feel really good about. And then baby Ravi came into the picture and he taught me so much about love and connection and that really love has no limit. And, and that's the story of how it became 51. He's now a growing, healthy baby. I wish he was here tonight. <laughs> um, he weighs a healthy 17 pounds, and he looks like a little Buddha <laughs> with a belly. Um, like Ravi, uh, our plans are growing, and we're moving forward. Our vision and plan for the future includes the creation of a brand new school complex and a fellows program that enlists people from all around the world and our educational model. Construction has begun, and we're using the most sustainably-minded design plan with a low-carbon footprint. The rammed earth architecture uses earthen blocks from the local land. It eliminates the need for trees in a country that struggles with deforestation and for brickyards where children are often working instead of in school. Rammed earth provides excellent heating and cooling, passive solar for winter, and in the heat of the monsoon summers, keeps the rooms at a comfortable 60 to 70 degrees. If we do our job right, our school is going to be the greenest in the entire world and a model that others can hopefully follow. <laughs> and I want what we've created to be earthquake proof, proof both literally and metaphorically. I want to create something lasting. I was just one girl with a backpack helping another girl in a world devastated by poverty and war. And it's grown into something so much bigger. It's grown into a community empowering itself and moving itself out of poverty. So our foundation is called Blink Now because I believe that in the blink of an eye, all of us can change the world and make a difference. And I invite you all to stand with me in that today and just start by believing that this is possible and believing that we can create a world where those grandchildren of ours look up at us and we tell them about the history of 2015. <laughs> um, with this award, you honor my team, my board, my right hand, Ruth Decker, and all of my children, my brave, brave, amazing, resilient little babies in Nepal that are just waking up right now. And I hope that through Coppola Valley, we create a model where every child in the world is cared for and loved and nurtured. And uh, I hope this is just the beginning. Thank you all so, so much. <laughs> Although, I bet if we all asked, if I took a vote, we'd all want Maggie to come back, so. Uh, but anyway, so thank you, Chris, Maggie, David, for your inspiring words, truly inspiration. For those I haven't met, I'm Betsy Bernard. I'm the chair of the CRCC Advisory Board, and it is a magnificent advisory board. And I would like to ask the members of this amazing advisory board to stand up so that I, along with everybody else in this room, can say thank you for your leadership, for your wisdom, and your support. So board members, stand up so that I can say thank you along with everybody else. I became involved with the center, like so many of you, when I met Jonathan. Now, I'm not a religious person. However, I am saddened by the horrible things that have been and are being done in the name of religion. It's hard to watch and not want to do something. 
And I believe that building interfaith peace and understanding is that something. That is exactly what's happening at Drew's Center. The peace building and leadership training that the center provides is truly one of a kind. The Carnegie Corporation saw that when it invested in the Summer Institute on Conflict Resolution. And as we heard from Jonathan tonight, the Endeavor Foundation sees it too. The center is supported and nurtured by the university and is so fortunate to have a president who is committed, as we heard tonight, to sending students out to add to the world's good. I came to Drew inspired by the passion of one individual to build peace. And as we've seen tonight, individuals can make a huge, huge difference. I believe that Drew's Center for Religion, Culture, and Conflict can become the premier leader in interfaith peace building. The kind of place that people seek out for education and training because they want to make a difference. This is why Lori and I support the center, and I'm why I'm asking you to continue your support of the center. With your support, we can send students on summer internships at places like the Arvada Institute and the Coppola Valley School. We can attract and train undergrads and grad students as the next generation of interfaith leaders and peace builders. We can train emerging religious leaders to build peace in their communities and transform conflict zones around the world. We can, and we will, and we are. Individually and collectively, we have amazing power to do such special things. So thank you for being here to share in this special evening and for your continued support to our mission of interfaith peace. Thank you so much for being here tonight and for all your support.